Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's uh, stakeholder workshop. This is for the Illinois Power Agency's Index Rec Procurement. This is for procurement of RECs from uh, utility scale wind, utility scale solar, and brownfield site photovoltaic projects. My name is Benjamin Chi. I'm with NERA Economic Consulting. NERA is the procurement administrator on behalf of the Illinois Power Agency. And joining with me uh, on this panel is Mr. Brian Granahan, the Acting Director for the Illinois Power Agency, Ms. Anthony Starr, as well as um, Ms. Katie Alandi from NERA. Over onto the next slide, here we have a couple of housekeeping items and then I'll run through the agenda for today. So throughout this uh, presentation portion uh, of this uh, workshop, uh, you may ask your questions at any time. Uh, and at some point, we will uh, also invite you to make your comments publicly if you wish to do so. At no point during this workshop, uh, do you need to announce your name or your company or your affiliations? You can remain anonymous. Uh, you can simply ask your questions if you have them or make your comments, uh, and that is fine. This workshop will be recorded. This presentation uh, will be posted on the RFP website, you can find today's presentation and the audio recording uh, that uh, to be posted at this URL at the bottom of this slide here, which is www.ipa-energyrfp.com. If you have any questions throughout uh, the workshop, simply click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, a panel will pop up a box. Uh, you may then type in your question and submit, uh, click enter to submit your questions to us. Um, and if you want to uh, raise a comment at the appropriate time, simply raise your hands and we will uh, unmute you at the um, appropriate point in time. I'll start off with a disclaimer. Um, so this presentation uh, that is contained here provides information about the draft contract that was recently posted as well as the RFP documents. These documents are in draft form only and are posted for stakeholder comments. So these documents at some point in time will become final. Uh, and so the gov governing documents pertaining to this procurement will include, first of all, the uh, Public Act 1020662, the Climate and Equi Equitable Jobs Act. The IPA's uh, Long-Term Renewables Resources Procurement Plan, the ICC order, uh, those are filed in docket number 22-0231. And when they become uh, final to be posted on April 28, we'll also include the RFP rules, and appendices as well as the final contract to be used for this procurement. So any statements that we make during this presentation that describe or refer to these governing documents, they are summaries only, and they are qualified in their entirety by reference to these documents when they become final and available on our website. For bidders that are participating in our procurement events, just take note that you bear the full responsibility for reviewing and understanding these final documents once they become available. And in terms of the documents uh, that have been posted, we do have, as I say, a procurement website that is the central source of information for all information related to the procurement. So, we are in round two uh, of two of the written comments in the development process of these documents. On March 30th last week, we have posted on the website um, the second draft of the index rec contract, as well as the RFP rules. So these are again uh, posted in draft form you will be seeing the draft RFP rules and all of the appendices more or less uh, in its full form uh, on the website for the first time, but the contract is, is the second version that are uh, being posted for comments. So the invitation to comment uh, document 
provides instructions as well as an appendix that provides some of the key changes uh, for your convenience as well. So please make sure to download the invitation to comment on the second draft contract and draft rules uh, that is dated March 30th on our website. If you click on the left navigation bar on the website, uh, on this link that says index wind, solar and brownfield, there should be a couple of sub links that appear right after. You can find all these documents in a draft documents sub link. And not only uh, are the second draft documents posted, um, we have maintained the documents when they were first, first posted uh, in its initial form in the first draft uh, on March 3rd, as well as all the comments that we have received pursuant to the first round of written comments. So you can find all the written comments on the website as well. Um, and the red lines are particularly helpful to review uh, what has changed between the first draft and what was used previously in the uh, prior procurement, as well as now what has changed between the first draft uh, and the second draft to be used for this procurement event. So for today's agenda, we are really here to kind of introduce you or rather to uh, provide you a very a uh, quick overview and summary of all the changes that we have made to the contract since uh, we have uh, posted the first draft and have received your comments pursuant to the first draft contract. Um, we will also kind of uh, shed some light about uh, the comments that we have reviewed but are not adopted at this time so that you kind of get some sense of where we are going with the comments and how we are thinking about uh, the comments to be uh, adopted or uh, or not. Sometimes you just don't have sufficient clarity to move forward. So hopefully this session will allow you uh, to refine your comments as you prepare them and submit them to us for our evaluation and uh, further adoption. So we will go over the next steps in the comment process uh, first. So in terms of the timeline, You will see um, here, we have posted the first draft contract on March 3rd. The uh, comments were received on the 17th. We have looked through all the comments, evaluated them with the utilities, with the procurement monitor, as well as staff of the Illinois Commerce Commission and the Illinois Power Agency. Um, and the second draft was posted on March 30th. We are holding the workshop today just to explain to you the considerations that went into the second draft uh, red contract as well as the draft RFP documents. We are in this period where we are looking for your second round of comments. They are due to us by April 14. And after that point in time, uh, that's sort of the close of the solicitation process. We will finalize the contract as well as the RFP documents by April 28. And then at that point in time, kick off the solicitation proper. The first uh, part of your participation is going to be the receipt of your qualification materials. That's due to us by the part one day. That's a noon deadline on May 18. Uh, don't miss that deadline if you're intending to participate in our procurement for these uh, utility scale uh, projects as well as brownfield site photovoltaic projects. Bids are due much later on uh, on June 23rd, but uh, the main date that you should be focused on is the deadline of May 18 for receipt of your qualification materials. So in terms of the changes to the contract, um, we'll move to item number one. I will just uh, start by saying that there are red lines posted on the uh, website you should download the red lines and review them. They are prepared for your uh, convenience and to facilitate your review. So there, there are a couple of changes that we have made. We'll summarize them uh, here. Start with item number one, access recs. We received a comment uh, allowing seller at its sole discretion to use these access recs to satisfy subsequent delivery requirements. So. The way the contract is set up is that we have these delivery year obligations um, and 
for each delivery year, uh, you have to uh, try to meet these rec quantities for delivery. And if you fail to meet them, uh, the way the contract is set up is that if you fail to meet them for three or more years, then the cumulative shortfall amount uh, is at or exceed the uh, annual quantity that you bid and you have committed to deliver, then it becomes an event of default. Um, and we have provided some flexibility in that uh, in such a way where the first stop year uh, is going to be excused and the first uh, full year is also going to be excused. So those shortages that occurs early on in the delivery term uh, are not considered uh, shortfall amounts uh, in such a way where it will lead to an event of default. And on top of that, uh, here, uh, someone have asked if the excess recs can be used to satisfy delivery requirements or not. And uh, the answer here is that we looked at that, uh, the recs that are received are price based on the vintage of the recs when these uh, electric generation have occurred that's one and two each delivery year we can only buy up to the annual quantity that you have indicated in your bids uh, that you're committing to so anything above that we're considering them, them as excess recs uh, they cannot be paid um, for budgetary purposes uh, each year you have to meet them uh, until the 20th year. So here, in considering whether to allow for excess recs or not, uh, we run into a few issues. One, uh, the price in which uh, the excess recs are going to be delivered, if it is for payment, how do we think about them? And it became uh, an issue because we do not want excess recs or recs to be delivered uh, in any way to be influenced by whether the contract is in the money or out of the money, depending on whether the REC price is positive or negative. Again, under an index REC structure, payments can flow both ways, either from seller to buyer or buyer to seller, depending on the relative difference uh, and where the strike price is and where the locational marginal price is at the index hub. So in this case, the update that we have made to the contract is one, for sure, we will allow for the manual transfer of RECs uh, to reduce any shortfall amounts in prior year deliveries, um, but not uh, to have a price tied to them. So again, this is mainly to help you manage the risk of entering into an event of default. Um, and because payment can flow both ways, uh, here we are saying that whatever the price of these recs may be when they were originally minted, uh, when you transfer these excess recs for the sole purpose of reducing shortfall amounts, uh, neither buyer will pay seller or seller will pay buyer for these recs. They are mainly to mitigate shortfall amounts. And the only conditions that we place on these recs is that they must be generated from the project and it must be associated with a vintage that is within the acceptable vintage period. There are 241 months, a little more than 20 years there in that acceptable vintage period. The other thing that I would note is that it could also be above the um, uh, project committed percentage. So things that you previously committed to a different off taker, for example, if you have excess, that you could also turn them in to mitigate the shortfall so that you don't end up in a event of default. So this is strictly there for flexibility to help you optimize and mitigate any of these shortfall uh, that will lead to a termination uh, in your contract. And this is at the sole discretion of seller. So you can choose not to do this if you do not want to, but this is solely uh, a tool for at seller's discretion for your use. So uh, you can find these in sections 2.3F, 4.1G, and 4.1K. So that's the first item. Maybe I will stop there.
and I want to see if there uh, if there's any questions um, or anyone have any comments you want to make, we'd be happy to uh, to take them on this particular item. Can't see. Oh. I like that there was someone that had their hand raised, um, but you raised, lowered it. Um, if you have a question, just feel free to raise that hand again. Okay. Yep. Um, Mark, you should be able to um, unmute now. Yeah, and Mark, yes. uh, just before you begin, you, you do not need to identify your last name or your uh, affiliation or company. Okay. Uh, please, please provide Thank your you. comments. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Can you take us through a very simple um, algebraic formula for how these recs are being priced? Just very simple. Yeah, sure. At a very high level, uh, wherever your your project is located, right? You will produce a megawatt uh, hour unit in each hour. That's just the generation in megawatt, the value of the generation at each hour. In your bits, you will name two key items that is material to this calculation. One is your strike price, and the other is your index hub. The index hub is fixed by law, uh, and the uh, eligible index hub to choose from would be the MISO Illinois hub or the PGM NI hub. And for clarity and uh, for avoidance of doubt, if your project in is located in MISO, it does not mean that you have to choose the MISO Illinois hub. You could choose the PGM NI hub if you want to and vice versa. You can, is that your election, uh, the strike price is what you name, the index hub is what you elect. When your project becomes, uh, comes online and is energized, uh, what we will be looking at is all of the megawatt hours produced in an hour from that project, whether it's with us or with uh, an off taker, uh, all of the generation is being looked at at that hour. And we also look at the LMP at the index hub, MISO Illinois or PGM NIHA. And we take the difference between your strike price and the index hub LMP weighted by the megawatt hours that are generated from the project. This is just a price component. This is not the volumetric uh, component of the payment. So, uh, you know, for payment purposes, there are always two pieces to that. There's the price and then there is the volume. So for the price, we're just looking at the difference between your strike price and the index price. If your strike price is above the index price, then payment is due to you from the utilities. Multiply that by the um, megawatt hours in that uh, occurring in that hour, you then aggregate across all of the hours, divide that by the total uh, generation in that whole month. That is the monthly rec price. In terms of the volume, we're just counting the number of recs with the vintage of that month that has been delivered. Once it has been delivered and transferred via a standing order to the utilities, gets or MRETS account, that's the volume. Multiply that by the price that is previously calculated. That's the payment due either from seller to buyer or buyer to seller. formula. Is it strike price plus or minus index hub rate times volume? I'm looking for an actual algebraic formula so we have it, we understand it completely. Yeah, let me see whether there is a... Um... Most, you know, because most of these long-term contracts, and I've worked mm -hmm. for utility in the past, you know, they'll have a formula in the, in the actual agreement as well as a example so that no one gets confused about this. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So uh, Mark, where you'll find the actual algebraic expression 
is really yeah. in um, section 1.85 and 1.86, 1.85 and 1.86 of the REC contract. Okay, thank you. Can I just ask this question? What is the, and I'm not debating it at all, just what's the rationale for the, the, the difference between the strike price and the index? Is that so that it conforms to market? Can you just help me understand? Yeah, I'll, I'll help you understand a little bit. Um, the way that the index rec structure is set up is such that there is, you can think of it as, you know, a, a certain cost you need to uh, develop the project. Um, and between what you have named, that's the total price you think you need in order to build a and develop the project between what payments you get from the utility and what payments you get from the energy markets, uh, it should get you to the strike price that you need. That's sort of the rationale behind that. So that is why you will name how much you think you need to develop the project. You'll be paid uh, something from the energy markets and the LMP at the index hub is really just <coughs> proxy of the energy payments and then the difference yeah is uh, what we will uh, try to cover to ensure that you have uh, to get to the strike price that you need. Does the high level intuition help at all? In this? It's helping me somewhat. And then is, is the LMP based on day ahead or is it based on hourly? So like does your, if you have, you know, if you're producing racks, you know, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. in the summertime or 9 p.m., is, is the, the rec, value varying by hour or is it based on the LMP for the day ahead or just that's the last question I have. Yeah, it's actually the real time LMP. The real time LMP. LMP. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Are there uh, any other questions uh, from others? You can either put it in the chat or you can raise your uh, your hand in the uh, in the Zoom, uh, and we will get to you. Okay, hearing none, maybe we'll uh, move to the next uh, item, uh, and feel free, you know, if you want us to circle back at some point, uh, we're happy to do that. So the second item uh, has to do with the energy transition community grant areas. And here in the uh, long-term plan as approved by the Illinois Commerce Commission, uh, the IPA actually has proposed uh, how we think about uh, providing a discount in the strike price when you bid for these ETCG areas, the uh, areas that are identified as energy transition community grant areas. If you have a project in one of these areas, then uh, you will receive a, uh, a, some points are not the right word, but a discount to your strike price for purposes of evaluation so that you are uh, evaluated as though you have these adjusted strike price, uh, but you're not uh, paid any differently in how you, you bid. It's just how we evaluate um, with some preference there. And, we have incorporated the idea into uh, the first draft REC contract, describing uh, the commitment. If you do have a project in one of these areas, ETCG areas, and are selected in our evaluation for an award, then what that commitment looks like that you have to have that project be within that area. Um, and the comments that we have received is that while the the uh, way that we describe the area is uh, mirrors what is in the law. Um, the actual area itself should be defined. Uh, and so we, we took that uh, and understand that to be wanting something more precise uh, to be the exact area uh, that is considered the ETCG area. So we have provided those areas in a table uh, in Appendix 16 to the RFP rules. You can find that in the draft rules at this time. There are 22 of these areas that have been identified. Um, and your project, if you want to have uh, some preference due to this criteria, uh, and you have a proposal to cite your project there, 
then uh, you will have to name specifically the name of the ETCG area and that specific area will now be required uh, in the product order to be specified uh, and the commitment remains that your project has to be uh, built and developed within that area. So that's the second item. I think this is more an administrative cleanup item, being more precise so that there is no ambiguity uh, which area we're referring to. Wanted to stop there to see whether there's any questions on this item. Okay, I, as I said, this is this is more or less an administrative item and a cleanup in my mind. I don't expect uh, this to be controversial. Why don't we move to item number three? Item number three deals with uh, a very specific proposal uh, that was uh, recommended by one of the stakeholders like yourself and was adopted. Uh, we adopted this first in the uh, draft contract uh, version 1.0 back uh, in the 3rd of March, uh, but we have uh, refined that. So in the first draft, we have extended the time. Uh, well, let me let me back up and explain what the, the change was first. So the, the change was actually prompted by wanting to see the bid assurance collateral that you provide for purposes of supporting your bids be also deemed as performance assurance under the contract if it is in the form of cash. Previously, because of the timing of when certain things are due, uh, you have to post pre-bid security. And if you are notified that you have won uh, a contract for your project, you will require to post separately the performance assurance uh, collateral. And if that's cash, you have to post that cash separately. Uh, so we think that there was some synergies that we could accommodate by just extending the timeline under the contract from five business days to eight business days so that the bid assurance could then be turned over to become performance assurance. This is only for cash. It doesn't uh, uh, make a difference if it's a letter of credit. You will have to post those letter of credit separately. But uh, the additional clarity that we provide in this new draft uh, is to ensure that the bid assurance collateral that you provided in cash remains as bid assurance collateral until all of the conditions for the release of the bid assurance collateral are met before we can deem it to become performance assurance and also provide you a cure period uh, in case the bid assurance collateral uh, is subject to drawing and you have to provide an alternative form of your performance assurance. Again, the netting of bid assurance and performance assurance is at the discretion and request of seller. Uh, you can choose not to have this netting take place, uh, but this is something that we thought uh, makes sense and it's a flexibility that we would afford to all sellers. So this is mainly, I think, an administrative uh, item it deals with the process of pre-bid and post-bid uh, execution. I would stop here to see if there are any questions on how this will occur um, or any comments on this, on this. Okay, you can find the relevant section here, 7.1. Uh, we'll move on to the next item. So this has to do with uh, an item we used to call the RFP project percentage. The RFP project percent percentage uh, is the percentage that uh, you would indicate as the percentage of the project's output of RECs that is committed or dedicated to the contracts under this procurement. Anything that is not under the RP project percentage is then uh, at your discretion, you can have a separate off taker take those uh, quantities of RECs. So that concept was introduced uh, previously and 
uh, in the first draft, we provided a one-time amendment to that RFP project percentage prior to energization. It was collected in RFP, but you're allowed to make a one-time amendment. Uh, this is so to provide you with additional time or the maximum amount of time to secure other offtake arrangements prior to the energization of your project. And more precisely, prior to when you would establish the standing order for your project. In this second draft, we looked at that uh, mechanism and we say, you know, there's really no point for us to collect that RFP project percentage during the RFP stage. Why don't we just collect it once from all sellers at the point when you're about to establish your standing order? So with that, uh, the first thing we did was nomenclature. I think we just removed the term RFP so that it's not confusing. Uh, to sell us and we just call it the project committed percentage. Um, so you'll find that in the definition, it's now been moved to uh, section 1.79, um, but the bulk of the operation, it's found in section 2.3, uh, sub paragraph B, uh, I, Roman numeral I, so one. So that's where we are dealing with the project committed percentage, but in terms of its operation, it doesn't change a thing. Uh, all we're doing is we're collecting it once instead of during the RFP stage. So there's no need for an amendment. Uh, you still need to memorialize this in the product order. Um, and anything that is outside of this project committed percentage uh, is at your discretion for an uh, alternate off taker. Uh, and similar to the uh, prior arrangement, uh, once you have made this. Uh, and indicate, it your, and indicate your percentage to the utilities, there will be no changes after this point in time. The next slide. So uh, actually before that, let's take some questions to see whether there's any questions on project percentage, sorry. Are there any questions or comments on the, what we call the uh, project committed percentage now? Okay, uh, not seeing any, um, we'll uh, turn to the next slide. The next slide, we will talk about the RPS budget. This is uh, an item that we have heard a number of times now, while uh, we have not made any changes to the contracts, we think it is worthwhile to just tee up the issue and at least update and uh, tell you uh, what the agency is uh, uh, dealing and how the agency is dealing with this issue uh, and to give you an update on this. Brian? Sure, thanks, Ben. Um, so this slide just runs through some of the different comments that we've received around the RPS budget. Um, specifically, uh, there were some observations on strike prices and what the effects of those prices would be. As, as Ben covered in a prior um, slide or in talking about a prior slide, as you have basically your strike price and then your index price subtracted off of it to produce a rec price. And um, given the fact that we don't know what future energy prices will be, that leaves some uncertainty around the RPS budget. And the higher the strike price, then uh, the higher the potential rec prices. And that's something that we have to then use in budget forecasting through forward energy curves. So we'll get into the next slide. Um, so there's a few other items here as well. Um, around providing some optionality um, back to uh, entities. Um, there's this si idea of buyer side collateral, um, which is something that we haven't really figured out a good way to solve for the idea that the buyer would post collateral in such cases, there's RPS budget issues, and then you could draw upon that collateral and make sure that there's payment due. The challenge there in part is, uh, where would the collateral come from? If it comes from the RPS budget, then we're tying up funds uh, indefinitely that we would want to use to support um, additional project development through other rec delivery contracts. Um, and then request for the IPA to provide analysis of RPS budget impacts in the 2022 procurements. And I'll get to that in a second through the next slide. Um, so those are some of the comments that we've received around the RPS budget. There's been comments really going back to since, since CJO was enacted questions around the index rec procurement structure 
um, juxtaposed against um, what are effectively, I wouldn't say fixed, but capped annual RPS budgets. They're not fixed because you're able to roll over funds from prior years and do so across a five-year period in a first-in, first-out basis. So you do end up with a big total that accumulates over time if you don't have a lot of expenditures up front. But there are caps in terms of what can be, what can be collected annually, and that does show up down the road uh, when you start modeling out future years and you, and you see if expenditures end up being higher than you forecast then you run into issues with having fixed amounts of collections or capped cap amount of collections is the better way to put it. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we're doing in the RPS budget. And we're really open to you know, trying to figure out ways to provide more transparency around how the budget operates, especially for developers as they're working with financing parties. And if there's, there's ideas on collateral that we produce on this point, we're, we're, we're very open to that. As it stands right now, uh, we're set to release an updated RPS budget in the coming days, uh, maybe sometime next week. It's currently undergoing another state of review. There's just so many different um, data points or formulas in the budget that it takes some time to vet all of it, review it, make sure that you're catching any errors before you release it. Because given the way that you have these sort of year over year accumulations and effects, small errors in the budget can create large errors in terms of what future years um, outcomes might look like. So we wanna make sure that all of that is ironed out and there aren't any such issues before we release it. So we're targeting releasing that sometime fairly soon. Uh, we have a draft narrative associated with it. We have um, a draft, uh, basically a draft model. It's just a matter of finalizing that and, and getting that out the door. Um, if you're curious about how the RPS budget operates in, in advance of our release of that, um, I would direct you to our 2022 long-term renewable resource procurement plan and the appendices there too. Uh, chapter two, I'm sorry, chapter three of that plan discusses the RPS budget and then the appendices are where you would actually find the spreadsheets that are used to support the tables that are found within that plan. That's the best thing that we have for right now, but we'll have a budget release in the coming days that does include um, our projections around the costs associated with index rec uh, contracts that have been entered into since the passage of the Climate and Equal Jobs Act. So that's coming in the coming days. Uh, we do use actual strike prices from those index rec procurements and a forward price curve for index rec prices. So we do have to make some assumptions there around what those contracts are likely to cost. And that involves trying to make assumptions around what future energy prices are going to be through the use of a forward price curve. What we've tried to do is make uh, build out a number of different scenarios as I get into the fourth bullet point there. There are 10 different scenarios where we alter future assumptions around energy and rec prices to basically say like, okay, if you go a little bit this way, here's what the budget looks like going out into the 2030s and 2040s. On the other hand, if you go a little bit that way, here's what it looks like in the 2030s and 2040s. And you can see how small changes in future assumptions make for big changes in the RPS budget outcomes. So we have 10 different scenarios that we've outlined, including some adjustments to future energy prices um, that will be part of the model that we publish. And then we'll have the ability for people to model um, their own prices based on their own projection of prices using the rec price calculator tab. So you can basically input what you think prices may be and then see what the budget effects are on the basis of those prices. So we're trying to make this more of an interactive tool that parties can use for their own purposes in trying to understand future RPS budgets. Uh, we've, we're also updating procurement volumes. What we do in the budget right now is we basically look at the RPS goals, determine the procurement quantities that are necessary to meet those goals, and then model those procurement quantities, um, you know, kind of on a pro rata year over year basis into the model. Now, the actuals for a given year um, are not necessarily reflective of what those target quantities are. They tend to be less. So for instance, the adjustable block program, you may have a little bit less performance in one category than another, or in our prior index rec procurements, we weren't getting um, a lot of qualified bids for or, or successful bids for the win category. So you might have lower actuals that are going to be modeled, but when it comes to what's happening in 2024, what's happening in 2025 and so on, uh, we're relying on those targets that we think we need to meet in terms of modeling the RPS budget outcomes. Um, as I mentioned, there's the sensitivity analysis around the 10 different scenarios, um, and hopefully that will be helpful to parties in understanding um, how small changes could have big future impacts. And then again, we're open to uh, developing any other collateral that would be helpful to parties to help provide more clarification on how the RPS budget operates. So that's where things are as of um, April of 2023. The next step will be releasing that draft. And then we'll be developing a long-term plan, our next long-term plan this summer 
for release um, on or before August 15th, 2023. So that's coming soon as well. And we'll have a new chapter three that features new tables uh, based on say program performance through this count or through this delivery year and so on as part of chapter three of that new plan. That's pretty much uh, all we've got in the RPS budget, Ben. I don't know if there's anything more you want to add there. Uh, no, I, I think that sums up very well, Ryan. Thank you. Uh, maybe we'll stop here and see whether there are any questions. I know there are a couple of uh, hands that have been raised. Um, it looks like we have um, one question in the chat from Brendan. Okay, Brendan, would you like to uh, uh, to speak or uh, would you like us to just read your questions? You have the ability to unmute yourself now if you would like to. Brendan, uh, you can unmute yourself. Okay, not a problem. Why don't we read the question? Um, so the question uh, from Brendan is, uh, aren't the RECs uh, ultimately purchased by the uh, LSE load serving entities? Do they now reimburse uh, IPA for the actual cost to procure the RECs? Could requiring uh, the LSE to purchase the RECs at the cost IPA paid for them assure the uh, budgetary concerns of developers? So uh, a, a few things, I'm not sure, Brian, you want to chime in, but the IPA is not a counterparty to these REC contracts. Our IPA is the procurement authority uh, and agent here to procure uh, these, uh, to hold this procurement event. The counterparties to the uh, uh, the contracts are the LSEs, that's true. The, um, the utilities, Commonwealth Edison Company, Amron, Illinois, and uh, Mid-American uh, Company. The, uh, Purchase of these RECs uh, will be from the RPS budget. So I'm, I'm kind of uh, unsure. I'm not sure if, Brian, you understand the question about uh, reimbursing the IPA for the actual cost. Yeah, the challenge, sir, I think the challenge here exists that the RPS budget itself is capped. So unlike, say, in a vertically integrated state, we're just passing those costs on through to ratepayers based on what those costs actually are. Here, the amount that the utilities are able to recover uh, as prudent expenditures um, under rec delivery contracts is capped by Illinois law. So it's not a matter of um, us having the ability to pass through costs at cost because there's no pass through. It's all actually funds being held by Illinois electric utilities that are then used to purchase renewable energy credits. The challenge exists uh, with how much the utilities are authorized to spend on those purchases. So even though this entire process is run by the IPA or the IPA's procurement administrator, even though we develop the contract forms, albeit we're doing that in conjunction with various parties, um, and even though the whole procurement process itself is basically stood up by the IPA, it is the fact that the utilities are the buyer. Then the question is, what can the utilities spend up to on RECs um, across the course of a given delivery year? And that's capped by law. We're able to roll over funds from prior years to help meet any future years balances that exceed those amounts. But, um, but because it is a cap system, it varies from other places where utilities are simply going to their state's public utilities commission able to recover things on that cost. Okay, hope that uh, addresses the question. Um, any yeah, other... so... yep, go ahead. Um, I was gonna say we have one other person. So Mark, um... You should be able to unmute to ask your question or thank comment. You. No, thank you. And thank you for indulging my sort of very early stage questions. But uh, if we're setting a strike, if the strike price in the last the last bid award was $72, for example, just indulge me for a moment. And the, uh, the daily average hourly rate for that day was 52 for the uh, hourly locational base marginal price. You take the 72 minus the 52 leaves you a $20 rec value. Do I have that right? I just want to be very elementary here. That's right. Okay. That, that's absolutely right for that hour. 
Yes. Uh, and assuming that that's, you know, 52 for all hours in the whole Understood. Yes. Yeah? So then there'll be $20 per rack. So just indulge me for a moment. So that's a, I understand that. Yeah. What is the what is the meaning of the strike price? Is that the price of the energy and that the $20 is the price of the rec? Or is this all under the guise, guise of a rec contract? So that the value that you're going to get at the end of the day is $20 a megawatt hour, not your strike price plus a $20 rec price. That is right. Yeah, you're not getting the strike price for purposes right. of payment. Uh, you're naming your strike price so that we can calculate the rec price for the month, which is the $20. Um, so we're just here again to fill in a financial gap, assuming that uh, for all intents and purposes, you're getting payments uh, tied to the LMP at the MISO NIHAB or the PGM, sorry, the PGM NIHAB or the MISO Illinois Hub, and that is insufficient. Uh, so we're just trying to Thank fill you. in that financial gap. That's yeah. right. So that, that, that makes logical, that's strong logic. So that $52 would be your LMP, plus your $20 would be your, your, your rec value. So you would get, in essence, for that one hour, just for illustrative purposes, you would get your 72. So your point right. is, that's your rec value of your 20. That's interesting. That's, that's creative. That's your rec price of your 20. And your strike price difference would be a, presumably your LMP. Got it. Thank you very much. That's the only yeah, question. Yeah, it, it's uh, analogous to the levelized cause of energy from the Understood. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. It looks like we also got another comment in the chat. Um, I'm not sure if the commenter would like to speak. Um, I'll give you the option. Hey, thank you both for the uh, uh, for for the questions and answers. Um, my question is around bankability, financeability, and just wondering if you have gotten any feedback from financing counterparties, lenders, and, and tax equity uh, in relation to this this topic, which uh, obviously developers have concerns about, but I, I imagine the uh, financing community would as well. Yeah, I think we have we have heard a, a, a bit of a narrative uh, through the comment process, definitely, and they have been posted online. And I think we are kind of uh, uh, a repeat on this risk uh, that is affecting uh, the contracts and the bankability of the projects and financeability of the project. So we understand that, and at this time, we're trying to be as transparent as we know how and provide uh, as much information about how to think about this issue. The IPA has a longstanding legacy of stepping in to, to deal with these, these issues in the past. And so uh, here is one item uh, and a, uh, an update on the budget that we are trying to uh, put out to at least you have uh, that, that you can bring back to the financing community and your investors. Brian, do you have anything else to add? I think, I mean, the one thing I would add is we've, we've seen um, certainly a successful participation, at least in certain categories in prior procurement events, which is evidence of some comfort level that financing parties can get behind this structure, even with the nature of the, uh, the kind of RPS budget caps. Um, but, you know, th those are just certain data points and maybe others as well. We didn't always see the data points where sort of financing party says no, um, because those never make their way to us in the same way as a bid might, right? So um, we, we have seen evidence that parties have gotten comfortable with it. I think for us, the best thing that we can do is, as Ben mentioned, number one, put together something with this RPS budget update that provides as much clarity as possible and as user-friendly as possible that parties can test their own assumptions against it. And then number two, uh, basically listen, and figure out what other collateral would make sense for parties to have as they know what questions they're receiving from financing parties and then we can be the authority who's putting something together. So that's, that's where we are right now. Got it, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm not sure if there's are there any other questions on this or comments. Okay, why don't we move on to the next slide? All right, the next section here, we're just going to touch on a couple of items that we have 
uh, seen, evaluated, but we really couldn't adopt. Uh, I will tell you why. So starting on uh, the, the couple of items here, there are a couple of items that are really restricted uh, either by the long-term plan or the law. And we just want to at least uh, make that clear. One is that we have uh, provided at the election of sellers two index hub, either the MISO Illinois hub or the PGM9 hub. Our hands are kind of tight. We could use either just one of them, but we have uh, provided both at the election of sellers. Um, but we don't have a way to, uh, for example, have the LMP index be priced at your generation bus, uh, for example. So uh, I think that's something that is fixed in the law uh, and non-negotiable. The other is just the uh, contracts bundled with capacity credits that to um, we have a capacity procurement that is separate from this uh, for uh, the MISO and we don't really bundle these renewable contracts under the long-term plan with the capacity. So this is not uh, on the table currently for the summer 2023 RFP that we are currently conducting. The other item, uh, we did make a uh, change to this. It's really not restricted by law or the LTP, but something that uh, a commenter raised about uh, one of the provisions for early termination uh, for convenience, uh, I, I should probably be careful because this is actually talked about in the plan. Um, and we do allow for this early termination request. If you bid, you win, but cannot build the project for whatever reason, um, and you just want to get out of the contract. So the... the um, contract itself provides uh, a couple of items there, uh, principally that you may make a request and that it will you will have to forfeit your collateral requirement, uh, but then uh, it allows you an out of the contract at that point um, after payment of the collateral requirement. The commenter wanted language uh, to, to mirror other language that we do provide for penalty or remedies under events of default to make clear that those are the sole remedies for buyer in that event. Uh, we didn't think that it was appropriate to call it an event of default if you were to make a early termination request uh, and payment has been received. Uh, but we did clarify that any actions taken uh, in that uh, section, section 4.1 uh, delta, uh, is not an event of default and that upon the termination of the agreement, buyer and seller are both not entitled to any settlement amounts pursuant uh, to that uh, eventual termination. So that's sort of uh, where we are on that item. The other two items uh, were remarks or comments that we have seen come in, but we really don't know how to make use of them because uh, no red lines were given to us uh, and the proposed uh, change or comment uh, is, is too vague for us to implement. So the first has to do with unit contingent deliveries. Um, what it means is there any obligations or, uh, or rec delivery quantities that must be met? It is not clear just reading that um, the comments there. And the second deals with what happens if there is a change in law um, given that the product itself is regulatorily continuing as the term is used in the contract, uh, seller bears the risk of making changes to the project. Um, but under the contract, we also allow for some flexibility for you to get out of those uh, of the contract if whatever that you do uh, could not have your project or your product be conforming. So. Under this process, we can only buy RECs that are compliant with the Illinois RPS. If your RECs are not compliant with the RPS, we just don't have the uh, ability to go buy them. Um, so you do have an out, you know, there is a threshold in which you have to meet in order to uh, claim such relief. It's already in the contract about uh, two years ago, we made that change pursuant to stakeholder comments. Um, so we were not sure in this second item whether 
uh, the stakeholder was aware that we have already made the change or is the stakeholder after something else? So it's not clear to us. So in general, we did not adopt that, but uh, we also asked for the next round of comments to come in. We asked that you uh, provide them to us in red lines so that it will help us in our evaluation and adoption of the changes if it is appropriate. So it is quite critical that we see how the proposal is being implemented in the contract. Um, uh, if you have submitted those comments to us before, uh, I will urge you not to just resubmit the same comments uh, thinking that we have missed it or have not read it. We read every word in those written comments. Uh, and we want to assure you that if the comments have merit, uh, they are taken into uh, considerable attention uh, in our site. So uh, please provide us in good faith your red lines of how you see these being implemented. And if they are critical to you, it, it is critical to us as well. So with that, maybe I'll just uh, open up this time uh, for any last questions or comments. See, it looks like we have one hand raised. Um, mm -hmm. You'll be prompted to unmute. Oh, it's, it's Mark again. Um, my question has to do with out-of-state projects. I think I remember reading in one of the drafts that out-of-state projects may participate in the program, which it has it cuts both ways, right? If you have a an RPS budget, um, this brings in projects that are outside of the state of Illinois. Can can you tell us a little bit about how you will review those out-of-state projects, or did I misread that? Nope. You you there is an allowance for out-of-state projects. Um, if they are utility skilled projects, wind or solar, uh, but it requires you to uh, receive pre approval from the Illinois Power Agency. Um, and I think it's say out of state projects, we mean state, states that are adjoining Illinois. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Th there's a process. If you look at chapter four of our long term renewable resource procurement plan, um, it gets into how we score adjacent state projects. Um, and I believe a, a score, and Ben, you can correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. the minimum score is 60 points per project to be considered eligible for the, for the one RPS. Is that correct? I, I think I think that's right. Katie, do you want to chime in on? Yeah, 60 points is correct. Yeah. And there's an application process, and essentially you can determine this on the basis of geography. Um, I believe, uh, Ben or Katie, correct me if I'm wrong, those, those reviews are done by NERA, so you have more experience with the different applications that we've received. Is that right? Actually, Brian, um, the spreadsheet is posted on the IPA's website, and those should okay. be submitted to. Um, there's a email address directly in the spreadsheet, um, and it'll go to the IPA. Okay, so then, then on our website, so if you have an, an adjacent state project and you're seeking to qualify for the owner RPS, then then through our website, there's a process associated with it, um, and there's more guidance available through the website. So yeah, there, there's a provision of Illinois law that says that essentially. Projects that are located within Illinois are considered eligible for the Illinois RPS automatically, but those in adjacent states, if they meet certain public interest criteria, may be considered eligible for the Illinois RPS and for these utility scale wind, utility scale solar procurements. And what we've done through our long-term plan, dating back to 2017, when we first published the draft of that, is take that qualitative public interest criteria that's found in the law's language and reduce that down to a quantitative scoring system. And then essentially, Parties apply their project on the basis of address and technology, and um, through that application process, we're able to determine whether they meet the minimum score, and that determines whether the project is qualified for the Illinois RPS or not. Brian, and it's good to see you again. I haven't seen you since 2017-18, but, um, okay. but it's good to see you again. But would you say simplistically that they have a, a, a bigger hurdle to jump through than those that are within the state? Just again, keeping it really oh. simple. 
Yeah, absolutely, because there are projects located in adjacent states based on the RAD address that will not qualify for the mm -hmm. Illinois RPS, and that's not true of projects that are located within Illinois. So it really depends, but it's binary. It's not something that's taken into account where there's an adjustment in scoring, like it might be in other places, or like it is, for instance, for energy transition community grant areas, where there's an adjustment in scoring, or for equity eligible contractor usage, or other things where there's an adjustment in scoring. This isn't that. This is purely binary, and once you're in, then you're competing on the basis of price. So it's it's um, it is binary, and it's and it's you have clarity on whether you can or can't. Brian, as a lawyer, you are. Um, if that wasn't the case, one could argue that it could go it could be go against interstate commerce, right? So it, it sounds like a, a a good thing that you guys included that. No. Well, it's it's um, it's a good thing the general assembly included that. So. Um, if you look at the Illinois RPS, if you look at the various proposals that were used to support at-risk nuclear plants across you know, both mm -hmm. 2016 and 2021, you will see opportunities for participation by adjacent states, right. likely informed by uh, dormant commerce clause concerns. Of course, there was a federal lawsuit around one of those policies to support at-risk nuclear plants that went up to the Seventh Circuit. Um, but, and that was one of the arguments alleged was that there were dormant commerce clause issues associated with it. Um, but yeah, it, it is the case that, it, that by virtue of allowing adjacent state project participation, you are taking that argument largely off the table. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That makes sense. And then this last corollary of this question is, under the term of the agreement that one enters into the REC contract, I believe it was 25 years, do I have that right? Um, the, yes, so, so that that agreement per se is, is locked in. That would, regardless of what the budget being capped is if you're in, if you're awarded, you're you should not be subject to the budgetary cap because you're within the budgetary cap and and grandfathered for that particular project. Is that a correct statement? I will clarify one thing up front, and then I'll let uh, maybe Brian take the the budgetary aspect to this. The contract itself uh, affords you. 20 years of rec deliveries, but there is an upfront um, period where uh, you it's contemplated that you would develop the project. So we're looking for projects that may, uh, get, that they are not old projects, but um, that may still be in development phase. And uh, the rec delivery deadline uh, for the first rec to be delivered currently is at May 31st, 2027. Mm -hmm. And it could be extended for good cost further out than that, um, up to 2034. So I, uh, what what I'm trying to say is, um, you could energize your project earlier and get paid uh, straight away. That's fine, um, mm -hmm. but the actual time for when the clock starts ticking for rec deliveries uh, will start when your project is energized. Fair enough. And the, the 20 years starts from there. Yeah. That's fair. Thank you. That Oh, those are my only questions, and thank you for indulging me. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Brian, anything else to add on your side? Yeah, I, the, the grandfathering point, just so there's no, um, you know, no illusions that, that this is necessarily fair to complete um, as a matter of law. Um, the challenge is that you have payment obligations year over year under all of these contracts. And the question of what contracts would have seniority um, should we run into a situation where funding were to run out in terms of what could be paid out under those contracts annually is something that really have to be litigated before the Illinois Commerce Commission. That's how it was handled across 2020, 2021, before all the changes that came in under CJA, um, where we were looking at a situation where we weren't able to roll over funds from prior years. Now, that ability to roll over from funds from prior years was fixed through CJA in September of 2021. So we have a lot more funding available now in addition to the overall expansion of the rate impact cap and annual RPS budgets than we had before. But the question of if there was a situation where um, funding was insufficient for a given delivery year, say 10, 15, however long, however many years from now, and there were a number of payment obligations that were due, um, how would that be sorted through in terms of what received priority or, or you know, otherwise, um, how you would make some sort of an adjustment, that would be something that the Illinois Commerce Commission would likely take up in litigation. That, that's my guess as to how that would navigate through the process. Very much. Okay, uh, over on the next slide. So 
just as a reminder, we're in round two, uh, soliciting your comments. If you have comments, please do provide them to us uh, by Friday, April 14. Um, and you can review the instructions in the second invitation to comment document uh, by clicking on the link. We will post this document uh, as well as this recording onto the procurement website so that you can review them. Um, with that, maybe I'll just take one more minute to see if there are any other questions. We probably uh, kind of five minutes after the hour, but we'd like to make sure that we address all questions or concerns you uh, have uh, or that are still remaining at this point. Not seeing any, I'd just like to thank everyone on behalf of the Illinois Power Agency for coming to today. Uh, your feedback is important and valuable to us and we look forward to receiving your written comments. Uh, we will conclude today's workshop at this time. Thank you.